Just a couple of quick announcements, because I have a feeling that in a, in a little while after YISCOR, this room is going to be a little less full. Just a reminder that we'll continue our Yom Kippur experience together this afternoon with Mincha starting at 5.40, 5.40, um, which will lead us right into Neila and the end of the day together. Um, if you own a shofar and would like to join us for the final shofar blast, please bring it when you come back this afternoon. And then I hope everyone will stay and enjoy a wonderful breakfast um, at the end of Yom Kippur together. And a last note, Sukkot begins in four days. And there's a lot of Sukkot stuff happening here. And Simchat Torah is just a week later. So um, just, just come, like every day. There's just something for you every day. Today I don't have a formal teaching for you. Not a formal sermon. Instead, I'm feeling inspired by a practice that a colleague shared with me a practice that she learned from her rabbinic mentor, which is to share what's known as an ethical will with someone very dear. An ethical will, you may have heard, is a written document that communicates values, memories, guidance, and advice with loved ones and future generations. Ethical wills aren't limited to Jewish context, but they do find their origin in Jewish sacred scriptures. From our patriarch, Jacob Yaakov, directing his children to bury him not in Egypt, but in the ancestral homeland of Canaan, to Joseph instructing his sons to bring his bones whenever they could back to the promised land, to Moses, Moshe, sharing his ethical will with the Israelite people throughout the entire book of Deuteronomy before he would ascend Har Ha'avarim, Mount Avarim, and die there. I have no doubt that most of us have executed wills in our lives to manage our physical belongings. What of our beliefs, our values, the guidance we so desperately want to share with those close to us? On this day, when we look at ourselves in the mirror and see our own mortality reflected back at us, we are invited today to consider what has remained unsaid. Dear Noah and Ayala, you're the most precious gifts I've ever received. It's the greatest privilege of my life to be your Ima and to support you as you grow. One of my greatest joys is sharing Jewish life with you. Even at the young ages of two and four and a half years old, you know that when we say Hayom Yom Shishi, today's Friday, it means that dinner will kick off with lighting Shabbat candles grape juice in fancy kiddush cups, and colorful challah with, what else? Sprinkles! <laughs> if you have not tried that, I highly recommend. You've already created your own candle lighting ritual, which you've shared with your fellow students at Nitsan Nursery School. Cover your eyes, say the bracha, and then shout, Shabbat Shah Peekaboo! while everybody erupts in laughter. You love blowing the shofar. You can't wait to eat in our sukkah, shake the lulav and etrog, light Hanukkah candles, plant seeds on Tu Bishvat, bake hamantashin, and sing the four questions at the Seder and in the bathtub. You know that singing Shema Yisrael in your darkened bedroom means that it's time to go to bed. All of these elements of Jewish life add up to what's called Jewish literacy, and that will enable you to connect with other Jews wherever you will be. As you grow, I pray that you'll deepen and expand your Jewish literacy to include parts of Judaism that are both traditional and new, things that I once studied, as well as things that I've never even heard of. The beauty of Judaism is that it's open to new layers of meaning and new traditions. Living Jewishly in our family also means coming to shul, you're both extremely comfortable in this space, as everybody knows. Whether we've stopped here while out on a walk in the neighborhood, or you're coming to Shabbat services, you know how to kiss the Torah, open and close the ark, and read from the Siddur. But you know what's even more meaningful to me? 
that you have made friends with other people at our shul. Noah, you love to sit with Leon, with Barry and Stuart, with Keith, with Katie, with so many other friends. You invite shul friends to sit with you at lunch, and I think you may have arranged a couple of play dates with adults without telling me. <laughs> and that's great. Our synagogue community is at the core of who we are, and one of the most special things about it is making friends across generations. You've got your own grandparents, Saba and Grandma, but you have a whole slew of shul family too. As you grow up, surrounding yourselves with Jewish friends will continue to be important, so you know you're part of something bigger, a culture that means something to the people in your lives. You know, when Noah was born, it was before COVID, and I threw a huge Simchat Bat ceremony and celebration. Our sanctuary was full of our family, friends from our shul, friends from all different parts of my life. I think that everyone thought it would be one kid and done, especially considering that I was a single Ima by choice. For some, one kid completes the family. I always knew I wanted more than one child, I wanted to be an ima from as far back as I can remember, probably as far back as when I used to enjoy taking care of Uncle Ur. I was six. <laughs> Having siblings, I knew, was a gift, in spite of the sister strife Auntie Mir and I endured. It was clear to me that I would do everything in my power to provide you, Noah, with a sibling and to give you the chance to flourish as an achot gudola, a big sister. It's better than I dreamed. Just in the last year, as Ayala learned how to walk, finally, then run and jump and say things, something magical has happened. You've become each other's bestie. You are sisters, your roommates, and your friends. At this stage, your friendship consists of Noah teaching Ayala to say new words every day, Ayala chasing Noah around the house and mimicking her every move and making each other laugh. Noah, you always look out for Ayala. And Ayala, Noah is the first person you look for when you wake up in the morning or after a nap. You love each other, and that is so precious to witness. There's a beautiful story in the Talmud. It's a story of two brothers who were farmers, and they tilled the fields that they had inherited from their father. The younger brother lived alone, not married. The other brother lived with his wife and their four children. They each lived at the opposite end of the field and equally shared the responsibilities associated with that field as well as the fruits of their labors. Those brothers loved each other dearly. One night during the harvest, the younger brother thought to himself, here I am all alone with no spouse, no kids. I don't need to feed or clothe anyone else, but my brother, my brother has the responsibility of a family. He needs so much more than I do, and yet we share equally from the harvest. So that night, he got out of bed, took an armful of sheaves from his crop, schlepped them across the field, put them in his brother's storehouse. He made that same trip back and forth, bringing more of his sheaves to his brother. At the same time, the older brother was also thinking himself, about his younger brother, and he thought, here I am surrounded by my loving family. When I grow old, my children will take care of me. But who will take care of my brother in his old age? His needs are so much greater than mine, and it isn't fair to share the harvest equally. So that night, he got out of bed, took an arm full of sheaves from his crop, schlepped them across the field to his brother's storehouse, and left them there. He made the same trip back and forth, back and forth, bringing more sheaves to his brother. Each brother, upon returning to his storehouse, was shocked to find just as much grain as had been there before he had taken some away, wondering how it could be possible. Each man filled his arms with yet more sheaves and journeyed back across the field, and it continued all night with each brother giving to the other but neither noticing the other in the darkness. The first rays of the sun appeared on the horizon. 
Only then, while crossing the field on the way to the other's storehouses, did the brothers finally see each other in the shadows, and suddenly they understood. They dropped their sheaves. They embraced, weeping with gratitude and happiness. The story ends by teaching that according to the rabbis of old, God saw this act of love between the brothers and blessed the place where they had met that dawn. And when in the course of time, King Solomon set out to build God's holy temple from which peace and justice were to flow, God instructed King Solomon to build it in that field on that very spot where the two brothers had embraced. Now, I don't particularly buy that last bit, that this was the site where the temple was built, okay? That's another conversation for a different time. But I share the story because it demonstrates so beautifully the way that each man loved his brother. Each with their own life circumstances, they were thinking of what the other needed. No need to ask, no need for recognition, just looking out for each other. The fact that they got the chance to see each other's love in action, well, that's an added bracha, an extra blessing. I see the beginnings of that kind of love in the two of you also. There's also plenty of frustration when you both want the same toy at the same time, or the same book, or worse yet, the same ima. That's okay. It's a normal part of growing up with a sibling. Every single day, you get the opportunity to express your feelings, the highs and the lows, and I hope that that's great practice for the rest of your life. Similarly, you are both learning to trust someone else's intentions and to be patient with someone else's needs. These two are skills that will serve you well as you grow and mature. Patience, respect for different ideas, these are qualities that are sorely lacking in our world. I hope that practicing your patience with each other and with me will enable you to empathize with others with whom you disagree, to listen to their perspective, to recognize that multiple truths can exist at the same time. Let's be honest, though. Your lives, our lives, aren't the story of 100% calm and cool. Our friends on Zoom Minion that Steve mentioned before have seen and heard some of that reality, and often it's not pretty. Noah and Ayala, the number one most important thing I hope to teach you and to model for you is that you can always repair. You must always, always repair. Last week on Rosh Hashanah, we tossed pieces of bread into the Norwalk River. It was great fun to see the seagulls swooping in to get their snack, but I was also thinking of the times when I messed up. With each bread toss, I remembered sadness, disappointment, some guilt, some shame. Since I respect each of you as individuals in this world, it was important to me to apologize to you for the times that I lost it. It was important to me to show you that I understood my impact on you and to show you how to repair. So on that walk home, I told you I was thinking about those times and that I was sorry I'd acted that way. I would try not to do that again. Today is Yom Kippur, and all of us are working today on repair. We must repair with our family and friends, and we must repair with ourselves, because we will inevitably cause ourselves disappointment. This is the work of Teshuva, saying, I'm sorry, and I accept your apology. Start practicing it now when you're little, and I hope you'll know how to do it for the rest of your lives. One other aspect of our lives feels important to include in this letter. Since your ima is a rabbi, you're both growing up hearing the words of prayers for healing and prayers for comfort. Whenever I sing Amisha Beirach on Zoom Minion, Ayala, you grab my arm and you want to exchange a grin. It's such a funny time for that. And when someone has a yard site, Noah, sometimes you sing El Male Rachamim along with me. You guys know that these prayers are important, even if you don't yet know why. And then there's Mourner's Kaddish, which you both know in and out. Sometimes I look at you when I'm helping our shul friends recite those sacred words in memory of their loved ones, 
And I can't help but imagine the day when you'll see me that, saying them for someone in our family. One day, hopefully not for many, 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 many years, you'll need to say those words for me. I pray that the love you share now in your early childhood blossoms into an unconditional sisterly bond and that it holds you together when you'll need each other the most. When that time comes, lean on each other, hold hands, and know that I've always loved you with all my heart. Love, Ima. We'll turn now 